Christianity has a tremendous need for a psychology like Jung's, and the widespread interest on the part of Christians in his psychology can be taken as a recognition of that fact. But the Jungian Christian dialogue has been going on for more than 40 years, and something keeps it from flourishing. In this series of profiles, we're going to meet people involved in different facets of this dialogue and try to discover what is happening in it today and what hopes there are for it in the future. Today we are in Chicago, near the Baha'i Temple, to visit with Murray Stein. Well, my name is Murray Stein, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a Jungian analyst. I live here in Wilmette, Illinois, and I've been practicing uh, analysis for 23 years. I had my training in Jungian methods at the uh, Jung Institute in Zurich. I studied there from 1969 to 1973. And before that, I was a student at the Yale Divinity School, uh, where I received a Master's in Divinity in 1969. Uh, and where I discovered Jung for the first time, started reading Jung with one of the professors there uh, in my last year. And then after I graduated from uh, the Institute in Zurich and came back to this country, I went to the University of Chicago and um, received a doctorate in uh, religion and psychological studies under the direction of Peter Homans. I wrote my dissertation, which became the book uh, Jung's Treatment of Christianity. And uh, since then I have um, had an interest in the area of psychology and religion and uh, have edited a number of books on the subject, Jung's Challenge to Contemporary Religion as one. Uh, I've given some lectures and workshops and so on on this. Uh, that's my biography and my interest. When I started looking at Jung's writings on Christianity, uh, which began intensively after 1940 uh, in, in his essays on the Trinity, on, on the, um, transformation symbolism in the Mass, uh, his work on alchemy was uh, uh, a part of, uh, and, and Gnosticism, Gnostic materials, and then his whole interpretation of the Christian tradition in Ion and his answer to Job in that decade of the 1940s and the early 1950s, he seemed almost obsessed with uh, this subject. And I wanted to understand why, uh, what was his interest, where was he coming from, and what was he trying to say? <coughs> because um, he was uh, trained as a psychiatrist, he had been a, a Freudian psychoanalyst, he developed his own theory of psychology, he worked with patients. Why was he turning so powerfully and uh, with so much interest now to his own background religious tradition, Christianity, his father had been a, um, a minister in the Swiss Reformed Church. He had six uncles who were also in that ministry. His grandfather had been a minister. So it was definitely in his background, but he hadn't shown very much interest in it until this point. And so I studied those texts uh, with his psychology in the back of my mind and trying to understand what he was, what he was attempting to do. And what I came up with finally was that he was taking a therapeutic approach to Christianity because he felt it was ill, it was in need of treatment. And looking at Europe in the 1930s and 1940s, you can see why uh, the, the continent that had been most heavily influenced by Christianity in its 2,000 years of existence was basically falling apart and becoming demonized by the tyrants uh, Stalin and, and Hitler and the Nazis and the Communists and the uh, Soviet Union. And um, he was feeling that uh, the tradition that had supported Western civilization to this point, the Christian tradition, was in bad need of, of uh, renewal and revitalization or therapy. And so I titled my book, Jung's Treatment of Christianity, playing on that word treatment that he was really basically taking Christianity into his practice as a patient and therapeutizing it. And so I wrote my book from that point of view. Jung made a diagnosis of what was wrong with Christianity, 
he had some suggestions for a treatment, how it could be healed or fixed, and he had some notions of a prognosis or a future where it could possibly go and be, become a, a healthier uh, and further developed tradition that he felt at this point had gotten stuck and was in a bad situation, bad malaise as a patient would come in a, in a depression, a midlife depression or an old age depression, falling apart thinking it has no life left. And Jung found there was potential for more life in this, uh, in this tradition. But it would have to go through a process of transformation. And that transformation process would amount to healing some, some splits that could be traced back into its, uh, into its formative years, into its childhood, so to speak, where there had been a very uh, strong uh, polarization between the opposites of good and evil that Jung felt had, had polarized to the point of becoming irreconcilable opposites. That needed to be healed. And so his, his suggestion was to, uh, that Christianity should stop theorizing about God as all good, uh, uh, summum bonum, but should consider that God or the ultimate uh, principle of, of the cosmos, of the universe, of, of being, is a combination of so-called good and evil factors, and that the definitions of good and evil are really ego definitions. It's what, from our point of view, looks good and what, from our point of view, looks evil in and of itself. It's simply entropy and negentropy, or constructive and destructive processes that are at work throughout nature and throughout the human psyche, and we shouldn't polarize these. We should try to keep the object whole. And so, since God is reality as such, that would be his definition of God. What is God? God is reality. If you want to think clearly about reality, you have to take into account that there are these two opposing principles, at least. Uh, and then he also felt that Christianity, while it had made some uh, attempts to deal with the gender issue of masculine and feminine, hadn't really resolved it, and that the feminine needed to be uh, redeemed, so to speak, or lifted up into a higher place in the, in the concept of deity itself. So the notion that, that uh, God is masculine and feminine should be a part of theology. So he is supposed to have rejoiced in, in the early 1950s when Pope Pius declared that uh, the Virgin Mary had gone to heaven and had entered the, the sacred chamber at the heroes, the, the, um, the sacred precincts, uh, body and all, plumbing and all, as somebody once said to me. And that meant that the Catholic theology, Christian theology, was preparing itself to include the body in a new way, physical world in a new way, and the feminine in a new formulation of divinity. Now that would be highly disputed by orthodox theologians that they were preparing the way for a goddess religion or a reconciliation between God and goddess, but that's, that would be a mythological way to talk about that. And so uh, these proposals that Jung made in his text have been taken up by various other thinkers and used piecemeal, and I tried to see what his intention was, what was driving those formulations and those recommendations. And I think the basic impulse was a therapeutic one in his part, that he really had Christianity's long-range future at heart. And he wanted it to continue into the next millennium, if possible, but in a, in a, in a transformed form. So he wasn't a person who was trying to get uh, past Christianity or leave it behind, nor was he trying to kill it off. Um, nor was he trying to preserve it in its present form. He was trying to facilitate a transformation process, which is what he would do with his patients in their middle years, or middle to late years. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are certainly texts in Jung that would suggest that he thought that Christianity had more or less run its course, that its uh, 2,000 years of existence were about as far as it was going to go, and it was in its last days and that a new type of religion would replace it, perhaps uh, taking some aspects of it um, into a new uh, formulation, but leaving the, 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 the form that we've known as Christianity behind. And in 500 years or so, he's supposed to have said that new religion would be uh, in place and, and evident, although it's very hard to see right now. 
And when he speculated about what that might be, uh, he would say things like, well, it certainly will be based on a quaternity rather than a trinitarian principle. There will be four. Four will be the number instead of three. And it will be inclusive rather than exclusive. It will be embracing of uh, the opposites rather than dividing the opposites. It will hold masculine and feminine together. It will hold good and evil together. It will be a world religion. It will not be a tribal religion. It will be universal. So uh, the uh, question of a dialogue between uh, uh, Jungian psychology and Christianity, uh, certainly there's been a lot of discussion on this subject. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of books written, conferences held, lectures given. But I think most of us would agree that it hasn't been a very fruitful dialogue. It breaks down at certain points. And I think Victor White would be the probably the, the, the classic instance of it breaking down. Victor White, who was a very, very sophisticated uh, theologian, um, steeped in the Catholic Thomistic tradition, with an interest in Jung psychology, studied Jung psychology deeply, and he and Jung had conversations. But they did break down at a certain point. And I think um, it's easy to see that Jung was at least partly responsible for that. Jungians tend to say it was Victor White's fault for not understanding Jung as a psychologist. And probably Victor White people say it's Jung's fault for not understanding Victor White and uh, what, what his presuppositions were. And I think uh, just going from there uh, to start, uh, I think that it would be fair to say that Jung uh, did cut out the ground from under a a method that would not start with and stay with the experience of psychological material images and uh, uh, limit itself pretty much to personal experience, the individual's experience. As soon as you begin abstracting from that, you would start getting uneasy. And as soon as you get into certainly uh, uh, metaphysical language or theological language, his re typical response would be, well, that's nothing but psyche. Uh, you, you have just dressed up psychologic, psychic images in another terminology. And that does cut the ground from under the theologian and the philosopher, so they can't really say very much if they agree, or they can just disagree with that. In other words, dialogue breaks down. You can't get very far if you, if you don't respect each other's starting points. And I think that has been a problem for people who are well-versed in Jungian thought and uh, committed to its uh, procedures and its methods. They often don't know very much about philosophy and, and theology and, and don't respect uh, those um, methodologies. And uh, it's also uh, possibly the case that it comes the other way, that the philosophers and theologians don't really understand the methodology of of Jung and Jungians. So I think the, the dialogue would have to start with an exchange on methodology and a respect for methodology and an attempt to understand each other's methodologies. Now, the way I understand Jung's uh, theory is that while he began and stayed for a long time with uh, the empirical material, the images and the uh, of the psyche and the dreams and the visions and the intuitions and so on, the ideas of the th that he uh, could relate to his uh, psychological uh, views. Uh, at a certain point, he did uh, go beyond them to theorize about non-psychological or extra or trans-psychological reality. So on the one hand, while he builds himself as a Kantian and says we can only know what we can experience, we can't know anything beyond personal experience, beyond the psyche, his theory does go beyond the psyche in the sense that when he talks about the archetypes and the instincts, both, they, they are rooted in non-psychological reality. The instincts are rooted in the body, which at a certain point leaves off uh, being psychic. Uh, so he has a term for that psychoid 
the instincts are psychoid, they're psyche-like, but they aren't purely psychic, and at a certain point you can no longer experience them. They're rooted in, in the cellular nature of your, of your physical being, your physiology. And so they go beyond the psyche, and yet they impinge on the psyche. They come into the psyche as impulses and drives and so on. The, the, and so the instincts are rooted in a reality beyond the psyche. And similarly, the archetype, uh, is rooted in a reality beyond the psyche. It's manifest in the psyche as images, intuitions, visions, uh, uh, dream uh, um, experiences, and so on. But it is not uh, limited to the psyche. When he starts speaking about the archetype per se, he says it can't be experienced. So it's beyond the psyche. What can be experienced is the psyche. Once you're into something that can't be experienced directly, you're into the non-psyche. So he believed there was something beyond the psyche and that these psychic images pointed to it. They were evidence for it. And if you did comparative studies, you would see uh, that throughout history, throughout time, throughout cultures, the same forms and images tend to appear and that those are produced by what he believed and theorized was a non-psychic level of reality that he, at one point at least, called the spirit, that the archetype is rooted in spirit, the instinct is rooted in soma. And he doesn't say very much about what that spirit is, but it's clearly not body and it's not psyche, it's something else. I think of it as noose or non-biological mind. And that uh, and then he theorized further that archetype and uh, and instinct are united somewhere. They're, for one thing, they're united in the psyche, where the images of the archetype and the impulses of the, of the instinct come together. So they're united in, in, in psychological experience. But they're also united back behind the psyche, so, so to speak, in a unified field that unites spirit and matter and produces synchronicity. Okay, and that's why synchronicity happens. It comes into the psyche, but it's also beyond the psyche. There's a correspondence, a meaningful correspondence between inner and outer experience. And the reason that can happen is that the world is unified in some way that we can't experience directly. But we can, we can uh, um, deduce from experience. And so, uh, he does go beyond his, his um, empirical methodology when he speculates this way, and he roots the archetype in a reality beyond uh, the psyche. Now, my own view is that, and, and I think this is very much within the Jungian canon, many, many other Jungians would have talked something like this, even if they wouldn't have said it in exactly this way, that the great religious and mythological traditions of, of humankind have, over centuries and, and millennia, collected this, these experiences of non-psychic reality from the spirit world, so to speak, have collected them in their myths, in their doctrines, in their theologies, in their belief systems, in whatever form, all of them limited by their own experience and culture. But if you put them all together, you can, you can get a more or less approximate view of, of their extension and depth. And that if you do that and you take uh, the, the whole range of uh, manifestations of, of uh, archetypal symbols, images in these traditions, put them together, that you have an approximation to this thing that Jung called the self, which is the unified field beyond the psyche. And I think if you look at Christianity, for instance, and you look at its elaborations from its beginnings in, in New Testament times, its, uh, the, its uh, theological use of those materials, its elaboration of those experiences in its uh, theology and mythology, if you will, into the figure of the of the transcendent Christ, the pan creator, the, you know, the universal man, the universal figure that Christ became in the, in the early centuries in the, in the 
doctrinal formulations and in the imagination, if you will, of the theologians and the believers, in that image, I think you have a, uh, an approximation to, and you appreciated this and even wrote this, that Christ is an image of the self. Uh, that is the Christ figure, not the limited historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth. He felt that it was limited in its expression, that, that his suggestion was that one could add to that figure, uh, particularly the elements of the feminine and uh, the, the dark, the shadow side, um, but that it's a pretty good approximation. And uh, in my own experience, my own dreams and active imaginations, I have to say that uh, at bottom, the Christ figure is about the best approximation to the self that I've ever experienced, uh, personally. So that makes me a Christian, even if I am uncomfortable in what I feel to be the very limited Christian expressions available in our time, in our culture. But at bottom, I would locate myself there, as, as opposed to being a Hindu with an experience of Ganesh, or, or a, a Buddhist with a, such an experience of Buddha. I do believe those traditions experience the self, or this ultimate unifying factor, uh, in their own ways, but being located in the tradition that I, I am, for me it is Christ. Now, the dialogue that could take place, I think, between Jungians and, and Christians would perhaps have to do with methodology as well as with content. and, and um, examination of uh, um, uh, the materials that become available through experience as well as through thought. And I, I do think also that Jungian psychology could use a lot of help in the philosophical area and the metaphysical area in building out the theory of the archetype. And I, I say archetype is singular because I think Jung really felt there was one archetype, the self, and that all the other archetypes or archetypal images were derivative from it but ultimately he was a monist. There was a unified single field that he called the self. It's very complex, it's a union oppositorum and all of that, but the ultimate term is a single term, uh, the self. So am I optimistic that a, a serious discussion, a uh, serious dialogue between Christians and Jungians will take place? Uh, I'd say no, I'm not, and I'll tell you why. Um, among Jungians that I know, and I know a lot of them, I've been in this field for 20 odd years and I've visited all parts of the world and uh, where there are Jungians, almost all, not quite all, but uh, many of them. I know a lot of them. Uh, there is a group of um, perhaps, you know, if we gathered them all together, 50 Jungian analysts in the world with a pretty good background in theology and, and Christian uh, studies and interests and a detailed knowledge of Jungian psychology, sufficient to be Jungian analysts at least. Of those 50, there might be 10 who are, are really good thinkers, okay, and could carry on a serious dialogue. And then of those 10, there might be two who really would do it, okay. Uh, who A, would have the time to do it, do it seriously, because they're mostly practitioners, and would have the, uh, the, uh, the motivation to do it. So there aren't very many in the Jungian camp when you get right down to that level of seriousness and ability. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, in, in those 50, there are a lot of them who write about uh, psychology and religion from time to time, who give clinical examples of spiritual dimension of their, of their patients and in their practice. You get a lot of material coming out, but the, at the level of dialogue that we're talking about, I'd say there are very few with the ability and the interest and the motivation to do it. On the other side, I don't know who they would be either. Maybe yourself, and maybe you found somebody else out there <laughs> who, uh, who would come from the Christian side with a sufficient Jungian interest and, and knowledge to have a, to have a good conversation. A sophisticated dialogue. So I don't think, uh, I'm not uh, optimistic that very much will come out of it. On the other hand, I think um, if you look back at all the 
materials that have been written and published in the last uh, 20 or 30 years on this subject, there is a huge mountain of it. Uh, and I imagine that will continue for some time to come, and maybe in that sort of uh, hit or miss fashion, not as a, a let's sit down and really work on this systematically kind of dialogue, but on a, a more ad hoc, uh, catch as catch can, uh, in, in that form, the dialogue is engaged and will continue. Maybe somebody, one person, will bring these two things together in his own mind and really uh, be a Thomas Aquinas and be able to put it together uh, and take it a step further. Uh, I think it would be an extraordinary individual who could do that because there's such vast, two vast areas. I think it would have to be a person who is more or less academically engaged and paid paid by, by some organization to do that kind of systematic thinking uh, because it's very intensive, takes a lot of time, and you can't be doing a lot of other things while you're doing that. Um, but um, I don't think it'll be done in conferences or seminars or uh, uh, two or three scholars gathering. Um, so I guess my short answer is uh, I'm not very optimistic. On the other hand, I, I would hold out some hope that in the long run something might come out of it. And there might be a mir miraculous appearance of somebody who will arise and, uh, and uh, write the definitive volume on this. It seemed like there were such people around a few years ago. I had, I had some faith in uh, Duran and Heisig, uh, but they seem to have fallen by the wayside, as far as I can tell, from the Christian side. And from the Jungian side, I don't see anybody who's quite up to the task. Uh, 